first experimental engine was built at Augsburg in Germany during 1893. Most people were convinced that no machine would work at the high pressures which diesel insisted were necessary. Now let's start our little journey into diesel learning. Here in an unusual diesel, this is a Chevy Cruze diesel. Not only are diesels rare in America, but this one's made by an American company, making it twice as rare. But the principles are the same. A diesel engine starts its combustion cycle by compressing air, and just air, highly. 22 to 1 can be as much of a compression as you find in here. Compare that to a gas engine, around 8 or 9 to 1, so it's night and day. Then at the very top of that compression cycle, the diesel fuel is injected, and it all combusts spontaneously because the temperature is so high, because the pressure has been raised so much. There are no spark plugs. That's how a regular gas engine gets combustion going, but these guys do it spontaneously by heat. Then, at the very last minute, as that piston comes up and compresses the hell out of that air, what happens then is this blast of power. It's a really high explosion because of that high compression rate, and you get that characteristic knock related to that whole idea of spontaneous combustion. So notice that one of the key timing factors that makes a diesel run well is the timing of that fuel injection as opposed to the timing of a spark. That's why very precise, direct, high-pressure injection is key to these motors in the modern era. Also, because they compress their charge so much before combusting, they tend to wring more out of the fuel, up to 50% of the energy in a droplet of diesel. Gasoline cars don't do nearly that well. Now, if you think diesels are noisy, stinky, and slow, you're probably over 40. Old enough to remember when they were. Modern diesels like a Mercedes GLK, a Volkswagen Jetta TDI, or even a Chevy Cruze are none of the above. And there are three important technologies you can thank for that. First off is common rail direct injection. The common rail part means you've got this metal plenum, or basically pipe, that has the fuel pumped into it under extremely high pressure, up to 29,000 PSI. From there, it is direct injected into the cylinders with extreme precision, partly because it has that high pressure behind it, and partly because they're now using piezoelectric injectors, which open and close extremely quickly, sometimes multiple times in one combustion cycle. Precise injection means better use of fuel, lower emissions, more power, better economy. Win, 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 win. The second big tech trick is turbocharging. This complex turbocharging is key because a diesel without it will tend to bunch up all its power down at the bottom of the tank. What the turbo does is help to spread the power further up the RPM range and get it delivered faster, get it off the line quicker. These things are not slugs anymore. That's an old school idea. The last technology trick is exhaust scrubbing. This Mercedes, for example, uses urea injection. Urea fluid is vaporized and sprayed into the hot exhaust, which catalyzes it to convert those nasty nitrous oxides into pretty benign water vapor and nitrogen. Secondly, there is additional sort of cooking of the exhaust. Hot catalysts downstream actually recook it a couple of times in some cases to cause a chemical reaction that also reduces the nasty stuff coming out of the tailpipe. And thirdly, ultra low sulfur diesel fuel has become pretty much the rule in the US, Europe, and many other areas. By not having so much sulfur, it is innately cleaner. And by not having so much sulfur, it doesn't clog up the other two technologies I just mentioned, allowing them to work. Now I can talk to you about high compression ratios and common rail injection and blah, blah, blah until I'm blue in the face, but all you really want to know is, does a diesel car drive and feel like a UPS truck? Or is it actually a nice car? Let's go for a ride. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Now the first thing you figure out in a diesel is, the is different, the red line is much lower, you don't run these cars up as high. There's no reward there. Like on this Jetta TDI, you get to about 4,000 and basically game over. It's time to shift. These are low-end grunt engines compared to a gas motor. And even if you do run them out, there's not much payoff, which is actually a very easy way to drive. We're just not so much used to it. The torque in the low to low mid is just a delight, and it makes everyday driving a lot of fun. It's also that kind of acceleration that we all love. You will notice in really every diesel I've driven, uh, less so at the high end, more at the low end, but there is a different engine note. There is a diesel rattle that is innately in there, 
and depending how well the car is isolated and insulated, you will detect more or less of that. You have to get used to that, but it's not a bad sound as much as a different sound. Beyond that, one of the other things you have to get used to is the fact that that damn fuel gauge hardly ever moves. Now, I didn't know if this one was broken in this car until I'd driven it for an hour and finally saw it come off the full peg and start to work its way down. Diesels tend to have tremendous range. Seven and 800 miles is not unusual because they have you know, normal sized tanks and can get great long leg highway economy in particular. In all, if you're in the market for a very efficient car and you enjoy the real joy of driving, which comes from torque, you owe it to yourself to drive a couple of today's modern diesels and see what they're like. I think diesels have a lot going for them and in many ways have got better market legs than a lot of the hybrids and highly electrified cars out there.